I've been using these two smartphones to shoot video for a whole year. So that's plenty of time to compare them. ISO versus Android. It's iPhone versus Samsung. And really there's just this one feature which has me asking Apple, why? But of course there are pros and there are cons. So in this video, I'm gonna go over what I like and what I don't like about iOS and Android. While I've been using these two systems every day in the work that I do, I've been comparing them. And this is what I found out. Up until 2021, I was mainly a Samsung user. I've shot movies with the S8 and the S9. Then more recently, I upgraded to the Note 20 Ultra. Last February, I bought my first iPhone, the 12 Pro Max. Because reading all the online discussions wasn't really enough, I had to try them for myself. Now I use both these devices constantly for my video work, on the channel as well as for other work. I wouldn't say that I'm really biased towards one or the other, and they've both had really pretty rigorous testing. In this video, I will ask which of the two devices and systems are most reliable? Which of the two systems is easiest to use? What about compatibility with other systems and devices? Now the computational processes are playing a bigger and bigger role in how smartphone cameras work, which system handles it the best? And I'll also talk about how things are looking for Android and iOS in 2022. I do find both devices to be pretty reliable, but one area where I notice a slight difference is in the accuracy of frame rates. Smartphones all record using a variable frame rate as part of the video compression. But when the processor of your smartphone is pushed to the limit, you might see frame rates start to become less reliable. And when frame rates are less reliable, you might see your videos start to look a little less smooth, especially when the camera is moving. The processor in the iPhone 12 Pro Max is an Apple A14 Bionic, while this Samsung Note 20 Ultra has the Exynos 990 chip. The new iPhones have the A15 Bionic. From what I understand, the iPhone processor chips are somewhat more powerful than the Exynos or Qualcomm chips, which you get in most Android phones. And that includes the new Qualcomm Snapdragon 8 chip, which is coming to new Android devices this year and has been getting quite a lot of hype. Because you see, a more powerful processor means more reliable frame rates, especially when shooting at a higher quality. You know, like 60 frames per second and 4K, for example. It also means I can happily shoot at 4K, 60 frames per second with my iPhone and it won't overheat. And you know, because when your smartphone overheats, again, it becomes less reliable when shooting video. With that said, I haven't really noticed a massive difference but that might be partly because of the way I use these devices. I tend to shoot 60 frames per second video with the iPhone more than with the Samsung. So I think I would give iPhone a small advantage in the reliability department. And looking ahead to 2022, it looks like this isn't going to change in the near future either. Uh, but here's one reason why I always use my Samsung, as I am now, for filming myself as well as for kind of close-up b-roll shots. When I'm working on videos for this channel, I want to work as fast as I can, but without sacrificing quality. For that reason, I often use the native camera and keep everything set to auto. If I'm demonstrating a bit of kit or filming myself, good autofocus really does save me quite a bit of time. If I film myself with iPhone, I find the results are usually a bit less flattering somehow. The Samsung video quality is kind of a little bit softer and gentler, you know, maybe because there's less aggressive tone mapping going on. Whereas iPhone tends to give you excellent detail, but that's not always flattering. For that reason, the Samsung is my go-to device for those tasks. So let's move on and talk about ease of use. ease of use, there's things to look at, like getting to camera settings, moving files around, as well as the compatibility of those files. The Samsung has a button which takes you directly to video settings. 
There's also pro mode, which I can get to very easily. So here's a little tip actually to make that easier if you do have a Samsung. Because in the more section, you can find all these extra features, including pro video. And you can actually add these to the main menu so that it's quicker to get to. Just a swipe on the menu gets me to full manual control. iPhone, it's not so simple. We can switch frame rate and resolution in the top corner. But for other settings, we need to switch out of the camera app and find the video settings, which sits within a menu of settings. Thing is, because iPhone doesn't have manual settings natively, I don't often need to go into camera settings. Rather, I would need to open a third party app like Filmic Pro. And if you have them both open, it's not so hard to switch between two apps, but it's not quite as convenient as the Samsung. So for ease of use then, the Android kind of edges it. So moving on, how well does each device work with other devices and other software? One of the things people love or hate about Apple is the enclosed system iPhone isn't my only Apple device. I also have the iPad Pro from 2020 and a MacBook Air from last year with the M1 chip. So getting my video files from iPhone to other Apple devices is very easy using AirDrop. On the other hand, when I send my files from Samsung to the MacBook Air, I either use Google Drive, which is kind of a bit slow and clumsy, or I use a cable and a little program called Android File Transfer, which works pretty smoothly. One annoying thing is that my Samsung needs to allow permission each time, and when you tap allow, Android File Transfer closes, so then you need to open it again to start moving files. It's just a small thing, but you know, when you're using your cameras every day, it's sometimes these small things which kind of get your attention. The smoother and sweeter everything works together, the happier the filmmaker. I believe there is a similar function to AirDrop on Android, but not so sure how easy that is to use and which hardware it works with, if there is something. And that's the thing, I'd probably have to spend some hours researching with no guarantee that it would actually work. But when you are invested in the Apple ecosystem, it's simple. AirDrop, it works. Time saved. Right, here is where iPhone has a slight thumb down, as Apple insists on retaining the lightning port. And this means I need a lightning cable for charging, for file transfers, and for connecting microphones. Not so with the Note 20 Ultra, which uses the same USB-C port everything else uses, including my iPad and my MacBook Air. There is actually a rumor Apple is gonna get rid of the lightning port for the next iPhone, the 14. But rather than use a USB-C, word on the street says they might actually switch to no port at all. Everything will then have to be wireless, including charging. So we're going to have to wait until the end of the year to find out if that's true. The smartphones add extra dynamic range using computational methods, such as HDR10 or Dolby Vision, which use dynamic metadata. Or well, there's dynamic tone mapping, which adjusts ISO differently for different parts of the image. When it comes to HDR video, iPhone has Dolby Vision. Samsung and other Androids has HDR10+. Again, the Apple ecosystem makes Dolby Vision much easier to use than HDR10+. If you want to edit Dolby Vision video, LumaFusion or Apple's native editing systems, iMovie and Final Cut Pro are ready and relatively simple to set up. But Adobe, for example, still hasn't got to grips with Dolby Vision or HDR10+. I've already spent several hours trying to stop Premiere Pro mastering Dolby Vision without adding a red tint. Maybe I could eventually get it to work, but it all comes down to time again. Apple supports not just Dolby Vision, but the whole process, as long as you don't mind investing in the Apple system. With HDR10+, you're kind of on your own. I also think Dolby Vision looks nicer than HDR10+. On the other hand, we're probably not quite there yet when it comes to using these Dolby Vision or HDR10 Plus uh, formats, because we're not 100% sure that people will be able to watch it. So it's still perhaps a little bit early for this technology, but maybe when it's more commonly used, 
Adobe will get their act together and it will be easier to use outside the Apple system. So now to the one iPhone thing I wish Apple would fix. In all recent iPhones, since about iPhone 7 I believe, Apple has implemented quite aggressive dynamic tone mapping. Most of the time, you might not notice it. The problem arises in situations where you want to lock exposure, but you have high contrast within the frame, which is also moving during the shot. Well, let me show you. So here we have a dark scene. Now I lock exposure because I want this scene to look dark, but as soon as I bring my brightly lit hand into the shot, the whole frame adjusts exposure. It's trying to even out the exposure across the frame, so it pushes up the dark areas to kind of match the brightness of my hand. Even if we switch to Filmic Pro and lock exposure, Apple's dynamic tone mapping overrides it. And this is pretty much unusable in a professional filmmaking situation. Android smartphones also do this, but Samsung devices allow you to switch to Pro Video mode, which completely disables tone mapping. Then you do get less dynamic range, but you get control of the exposure. Why Apple doesn't implement this, I just don't know. Because then we could choose to use tone mapping when it helps us and switch it off when it works against us. It just seems like a really simple thing to do. So please, fix this one thing, Apple. After a year of use, I've kind of settled on a workflow which seems to be pretty efficient now. Essentially, I use my Samsung for talking to camera and equipment shots, for example, how-to content where I'm showing how stuff works. But for stuff like filming with a gimbal, I use iPhone. The more reliable frame rate and the extra dynamic range, plus more support from the apps which come with the gimbals, deliver some really nice quality video. Turns out smartphones are kind of like people with strengths that complement each other when put together, which is like a message to humanity, isn't it? When we work together, we win together. I think I might have a future hosting corporate team building events. What do you think? But seriously, if I had to choose one, I guess I would pick iPhone. As I'm invested in the Apple system, it makes my life easier. Plus the Apple processor appears to be somewhat ahead of the game right now. But good news is I don't actually have to choose and I am eyeing up the S22 or maybe the Note 22 if there is one as an upgrade this year. If you want to learn more about smartphone filmmaking you can join us on Patreon. We have all kinds of extra learning material there plus you can uh, chat to me anytime you want uh, through Patreon. So really big thanks to all the new members on Patreon because you're really helping to support this channel and it helps me to keep making these videos. So that's it for this video. Uh, I hope you enjoyed it and I'll see you in the next video.